So let's give you some ground rules. We're going to have some fun. I'm going to ask you some questions. And if you get the answer right, I've got this big bucket of candy. Thank you, Brian. So there are rewards for paying attention and having the right answers. So the Bible is really cool. It talks about a lot of things. And interestingly enough, today we're going to talk about dinosaurs. Dinosaurs probably are a little bit controversial. And so to kind of kick things off and to show you how all this is going to work, I'm going to ask you a question and we'll see if anybody knows the answer. There was a dinosaur who was peculiar to the Denver area. Does anybody know what the name of that dinosaur was? Alex. No, close. It was Bronchosaurus. Oh, oh, yes. No, this was a Bronchosaurus, and there's a few of those dinosaurs in here today still. So one of the questions you probably want to know, why did I get picked to do this series? Well, I'm kind of nerdy, right? I don't know what you all did for the 4th of July. My wife and I went down to Taos. On the way to Taos, we listened to a podcast on epigenetics. So I'm a big fan of science. I like to hear whatever the latest, greatest stuff is. I also have another interesting thing in my history. In college, I was a debater. And if you know anything about collegiate debate, what they require of you is that you have to take both sides of an argument. You have to sit back and say, I'm in favor of this and argue for that for one round. And then they come to a, figure out who's going to be the winner. And the next round, you have to take the completely opposite side. So I learned in college to be able to reason and understand from both sides of the table. Now, I really like science. And there's a couple famous scientists that I really like. The first guy, anybody, if you're under, let's say, sixth grade, anybody know who this is? Just say it. Albert Einstein. Albert Einstein. Good, good. That's what we want. Okay, and Albert Einstein was famous for something. He wrote a number of papers at the turn of the 19th century about relativity. And one of the things he spoke about was what was called the special theory of relativity. And he came up with a term called space-time. Now, this gets a little bit nerdy, but I want you to see in my journey in trying to understand the Bible that I really like science. But I had to figure out, I'm coming into the Bible and I need to see how the Bible talks about these things. Because the Bible isn't a science book, but it does talk about these things. So I, as I began to learn and understand about space-time, I was curious, what does the Bible say? And interestingly enough, do you know how Genesis 1 opens up? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And do you know what's said in that simple little verse? That there was a beginning, there was time, and time started. Now that's really peculiar because all of the ancient people believed that time was continuous. It never started, it never ends. But the Bible says everything had a beginning, just like Einstein said. And he said he created the heavens. And you're going, that sounds like space-time. Now, you may be thinking I'm stretching it a little bit, but we'll talk more about this and I'll proceed to progress these ideas to you. Then we come to another scientist. This is for if you're in junior high or high school, tell me if you know who this one is. This one doesn't have the name on it. This gentleman. Hubble, Edwin Hubble, who said that? Way in the back. I'll chuck it as far as I can. Sorry, Gary, didn't mean to hit you. Now, Edwin Hubble comes along, and again, this was in the 19th century, and he discovered a very interesting thing. As he started to observe through his telescope, he noticed that galaxies were, seemed to be redshifting apart and that they were moving, and so he began to understand that it looks like the universe is expanding. It is. It is. That's right. But you know what the Bible says? Right? It talks about in the beginning, one of the things that God does is that he created an expanse. Going, well, huh, that's kind of interesting, isn't it? And you also find out that 10 times in the Old Testament, it talks about God stretching out the heavens. It's like, well, for a bunch of ancient people to even have that concept is really rather remarkable. And the third scientist we're going to look at is this guy. This is if you're uh, an adult. Anybody know who this guy is? Famous, famous scientist. He's one of the uh, discoverers of a particular molecule called the DNA molecule. You got the first name right. Francis. What's his last name? No. 
There you go, Derek. Sorry, I can't throw as far. Francis Crick. Francis Crick discovers the DNA molecule. DNA is responsible for the blueprint of life. Now, I started reading in the Bible when I was in college and really started getting interested in this. And all of a sudden, I see in the first chapter of Genesis that over and over again, 10 times as a matter of fact, it talks about kinds. Anybody know what a kind is? What's a kind? Well, it's kind of like a species, but I'll give you, that's pretty close. A type, like what type of whatever it is. Close, okay. So this is a little bit difficult, right, because you have all of the stuff with the genus and families and all of that kind of stuff. But what a kind basically is, in the simplest terms, is two animals that can meet together and still produce something. So can a dog and a cat produce what? A dat? No. Can they do that? No, they can't do that. How about, say, a tiger and a lion? Yes, that's, yes. That's, okay, there's two things that it can do. Uh-oh, you know lots about this. Okay, so that's a kind. There is such a thing as a liger, right? So you can breed between kinds, and this is basically what we discovered with the DNA molecule. How basically you can combine and, and how life originates and what the blueprint is, and that you can't violate those bl blueprints. So it really got my attention. I'm sitting there going, hmm. This is fascinating. I'm starting to see and understand that even though the Bible isn't a science book, it talks about things that seem rather peculiar. It, it talks about ideas like space-time and stretching out the heavens, and it starts talking about kinds. So as that began to, to cross my mind, I began to look further and further into the Bible. Now, I'm not one of those kind of guys who just takes everything for granted. I ask lots and lots of questions. Right? I want to know why, I want to know where, I want to know how, and I want to know if it makes sense. So for the Bible to have my attention and to get me to be a devoted follower, it has to be true. And there has to be substantial evidence to get me to understand that. So I'm going to take you on a real quick journey, because I want you to understand the entire creation story. We're going to do that real quickly in a couple of slides. And what I want you to pay atten attention to is what gets created on what day. Fair enough? So... Our first day, God said, let there be light. light. Now, that's fascinating. If you just, for example, had been an ignorant person, I don't want to say ignorant, but you're way, way back in history and you don't have a lot of science, what do you think you might have thought would be the first thing that God might create? Or if you were, let's just say you were trying to fool a bunch of people, you surely wouldn't pick light. Light is a fundamental building block of the universe, right? It produces photons. You're going, photons, energy. And what does the Bible say? The first thing God did was create light. Then what does he do? Day two. He creates an expanse, right? It talks about there was this watery chaos that was the earth because everybody's trying to figure out, if you read the articles, where did water come from? The Bible says it was always here. Right? When God initially created the earth, there was this large body of water. And he began then to stretch out this body of water, and he created the atmosphere, and he created space on the second day. Day three, what does he make? Land. He says, let there be land, and let it separate the waters from the land. Well, it's not Brian did those pictures. He didn't do a very good job, did he? So <laughs> talk to him. Okay? But the other thing that happens on the third day, two things happen on the third day. He separates the waters and the land, and then he creates vegetation. Absolutely. You, here. You get a double portion for that one. Because this is really peculiar. You're going to see something in here that really stumped me. On day four, you know what he creates? The sun, the moon, and the stars. But I immediately, in my mind, because I ask questions all the time, I said, wait a second, somebody got this, somebody messed up, right? Because on day three, we got plants, and on day four, we get the sun. Yeah. You're going, uh-oh, major problem. No, not necessarily. Not necessarily. I like this girl. I'm going to give her the mic. <laughs> the interesting thing about this, because it stumps you, and you're going, wait a minute, didn't they understand photosynthesis and all of this stuff? It's like... No, this is very interesting. What did the ancient people like to worship? Anyone? The what? The sun, you're right. 
Oops, sorry, honey, I didn't mean to hit you in the head. <laughs> they like to worship the sun, and they worship the celestial bodies. But in the biblical account, God gets these, what appears to modern man, to be out of order. And the question is, why? Because God is a purposeful God. Why do you think he would create... Pl well, you already gave me the answer. The reason why God creates plants before he creates the sun is so that the Jewish people would understand he was the source of life, not the sun. All the ancient cultures believed that it was the sun that gave life to the earth, and God's saying, no, it was me, and I want you to understand that. Okay? Then we get to day four, and a lot finally starts to happen on day four. Okay? What does God make on the fourth day? Fish. Animals, right. Which animals did he make? He made the fish of the sea and he made the birds of the air. He made pretty much like all of the stuff. Yeah, that's the fish of the sea. Okay? All of those creatures. Okay? On day six, what does he make? Land animals. Land animals, that's right. Land animals, and he also makes something else on the sixth day. What else? The crowning achievement of creation. He made mankind. Okay? He made mankind. He made them male and female. Now, are we just like the other animals that he created? What makes us different? God says we were created... In his image, that's right. It makes us special. It gives you purpose. It tells you who you are. You were a child of the great king who created the universe. And he has a plan for your life. Right? We're not like the other animals. We were created differently. Okay. Trick question. On what day did God create the animals? Day two. Not day four. Day five. day five and six, right? It was day five and six. On day five, he makes the, the fish and the birds, and on the sixth day, he makes the land animals. This is going somewhere, trust me. So... I start contemplating all of this and I have some problems. And you know what my problem is? Dinosaurs. I know. What day did God... If all you have is the first chapter of Genesis, when did God create the dinosaurs? Day six. You're going to have a ton. <laughs> okay. So if dinosaurs are animals and all that you have to work with is the biblical account, it would appear that dinosaurs were created on the sixth day. Now, that again gave me another problem because I'm saying everything that I've been taught in school tells me what? The dinosaurs went extinct hundreds of millions of years ago before mankind arrived. It's okay. Give me a chance. <laughs> So now I have to start looking at this. And so what I began to do in my, at least what I thought was rational mind, was try to figure out how do I fit dinosaurs into the Genesis story. And so what I did is I began to think, well, what happened was is that they existed before man and they all died off and then God made man. But a friend of mine pointed out you got a, a serious theological problem. Anybody know what theological means? means you've got a problem with what the Bible says. Because the Bible says something very interesting. Right? When did death enter into the world? Um, when um, Adam sinned. Aha! You read ahead. That's right. <laughs> death entered into the world when Adam sinned. And my friend pointed this out to me. He said you got a serious problem because what you're saying is a whole bunch of things had to die and then man came along and sinned and, that and then there was consequence of that. He said, you've got a serious problem because you've already had death in the world. 
And he used this scripture, and it says, when Adam sinned, sin entered the world. Adam's sin brought death, so death spread to everyone, for everyone sinned. At the beginning of the story of Adam and Eve, there was no death. Nothing died. No animals had died. No people had died, although there were only two people on the earth. None of the animals died. You're going, ha, huh, this is very interesting. So if the biblical account is true, I have to kind of start doing some more examination of what it is that I believe and why I believe it. Now, as I kept reading in Genesis, I came across another problem. And this is where you get to, if you have one of the old Bibles, it, I used to call it the begats, right? They'd say, this guy begat, this guy begat, this guy just made, they had a kid and his kid was this name and that kid had kids and that was their name. Next slide, please. And so when you look at this, this is the story according to the Bible about Adam at the very top all the way to Noah. And if you're paying attention and you start looking at that, you're going, well, he's living a whole lot longer than I ever will. What's going on? Is the Bible wrong? No. That can't be right. Because what is, what is the top age of a person? My mother-in-law is 93, and she's probably going to have another 20 years. Okay. The oldest person I knew was almost 103. 103? Evidently, there are people who can get to as long as like 120, but the Bible's saying they have all these, these really old people. I'm going, this doesn't make sense to me. So I had to do some more research. I'm having problems with the dinosaurs. I'm having problems because the Bible says all these people live so long. Something evidently was happening that I don't understand. And that something that I didn't understand is the flood. It was a cataclysmic event. And sometimes we don't give the flood probably all of the understanding that it deserves. Because when the flood happened, everything changed. How many of each animal was it were on the ark? Three. Mary, how many? Two. two, that's right. Okay, so there were two of every animal. Now, if there were two of every animal, how many dinosaurs were on there? Three. At least two of every kind. Now, remember we talked about initially kinds? So if you're putting kinds on the ark, does that mean, for example, every kind of dog has to be on the ark, from chihuahuas to Great Danes? No. It means it just has to have, like, one of them, but then God can just create more. Like, right? Well, what's interesting is you have kinds, and so all you need is a canine pair, and from a canine pair, you can begin to breed for qualities and get everything again from chihuahuas to Great Danes. Did you know that? Very interesting. So they go through and they try to measure how many kinds could fit on the ark. And I'm not going to talk to you about all the things about the ark, but suffice it to say, you can get a lot of animals on this boat. Just like if we want to get a whole bunch of people in church, what do we do? No, we don't make more room. We get smaller people, right? That's how you fill the ark. You don't fill the ark with giants, you know, uh, bronchiosauruses who are, you know, hundreds of feet long. You get an itty-bitty bronchosaurus, and you put him on the ark because he doesn't take much space up, he doesn't have much waste, and he doesn't eat much food, okay? So the question is, were there dinosaurs on the ark? It would appear, if you're going to believe the biblical account, dinosaurs were on the ark, but something happened, and we don't see them anymore. So we've got to try to figure out, does the Bible give us any clues about what was happening? And it turns out that it does. Now, one of the aids that I like to, to express to people, this helps me understand. Do you know what version of the earth you're living on? Most of you probably never even considered this. You're living on earth version 3.0. Going, really? Yeah. Let's talk about the various versions. Earth version 1.0, what did it look like? Lava? <laughs> no, I don't think so. There were two humans on it, and they were perfect. In terms of the genetics of those two human beings, they were absolutely perfect. All of us, we have defects, right? If you're going to start this off in terms of a, an ultimate breeding pair, if you will, their genetics have to be absolutely perfect. Otherwise, the human race would die off very quickly. 
What else do we know about that world that they lived in? In Genesis chapter 2, it says that there was no rain, but a mist used to rise from the ground. When was the first time that it rained? The flood. The flood. That's right. It's okay, we'll talk later. Okay? They also lived in a perfect environment. If you go through some of the scientific journals and you'll find out that they've discovered like plant life on both of the uh, polar caps, and they're sitting there going, well, that doesn't make sense because the world doesn't work that way. Well, evidently at one time it did work that way. And it appears that there was huge amounts of flora and fauna everywhere. It was as if the world was a giant greenhouse. And if you read the biblical scholars, that's exactly what they seem to indicate was going on. The other thing, when you think about dinosaurs, if the dinosaurs had been on the ark, wouldn't they have eaten all the other animals? What? Oh, but do you leave T-Rex off? I saw T-Rex. He had to get on the boat. You think he just took the eggs? That's a possibility. Okay. <laughs> what it tells us in Genesis chapter 1 is that everybody was a vegetarian. Now, for all of you people who like steaks, I know that's probably a big disappointment. But there's a rationale behind that. Evidently, in a perfect world, the food sources that were available didn't require us to eat any type of animals. And neither did the animals have to eat other animals. They only ate plants. And so you start to begin to look at the biblical account and these little hints that it begins to give you, and you're trying to put all of those together. It then tells us that Adam and Eve sinned, and as a result of Adam and Eve's sin, what happened? Death came into the world. So now we have earth version 2 after the fall. So a couple things we begin to see. Adam is cursed by what? What does God tell Adam is going to happen because he didn't do what God said? Well, yeah, the apple, but what was, what was Adam's consequence of his action? No, that was kind of both of them. God says, Adam, because you did this, you're going to have to work by the sweat of your brow, and the earth is now going to put forth thorns. In other words, it used to be easy for you, Adam, to get food, and now it's going to be difficult. Another thing that began to happen is when we read the Genesis account in about in chapter 6, we begin to read that people became wicked. They were without God, and they started doing a lot of bad things. So we saw sin become very bad. And um, the other thing that we probably saw, the earth that Noah started out on probably looked very different from what it looks like today. When you look at a globe and you look at the various continents, it probably didn't look the same. And I'll tell you why that is in just a minute. They believed that there was something like a protective canopy that enveloped all the earth. And the reason for that, it says it never rained. Well, if it never rained, you don't have clouds. And if you don't have clouds, you don't have atmospheric conditions that produce the seasons that we're used to. You get kind of this mild temperature everywhere. And you're going, well, what protected them from the sun's radiation? Well, something did. And why do they speculate something did? Because Remember that slide with the guys who lived really, really old? Guess what happens? If you take humans and you protect them from the sun's radiation, they live longer, right? As much as we like the sun, and you maybe like to get out and get a tan, that really isn't as good for you as you think. The other thing that begins to happen, if you have a protective canopy that is some substance, some watery substance, but not uh, clouds, is it would have condensed the atmosphere, they believe, and led to more oxygen available for everybody. When you look at T-Rex, anybody ever notice he has a really big back end but an itty-bitty chest? Be hard for him to breathe in, in today's environment, right? Because he just didn't have the lung capacity. I'm going to show you another thing about a bird that's in the, in the thing, in the, uh, that science understands from the fossil record about birds. And we'll show you that the speculation is the only way these birds could fly was if there was increased atmosphere. Now, if you get sick, and in special conditions, the doctor may put you in a barometric chamber. You know what a barometric chamber does? It increases the oxygen level. You know why? Oxygen has a healing effect on you. Yeah, and if you have lots of oxygen, you ever watch the football games? The football players, when they run down the field, they go to the bench, and what do they put on their face? 
an oxygen mass, right? I want oxygen because I'm at a mile high. That oxygen helps me recover very quickly and helps me perform. So they believed there was a protective canopy that protected them from the sun. It basically produ it produced a greenhouse environment, a perfect world where there were constant temperatures. And when there were constant temperatures, what do you think the plants did? They burst into bliss. They what? Burst into bliss. <laughs> That's right. They flourished. Right? And you can become huge, huge plants because if you're a giant dinosaur, what do you need? You can't go eat a head of lettuce. That isn't going to help you, right? You need huge trees and ferns and all of this in order to be able to eat. Okay? Then we had the story of the flood, Noah's Ark. And when Noah's Ark came about, everything changed. It was a cataclysmic change, and that gets us to Earth version 3. What happened after the flood? We got rain, and when we got rain, we got clouds, and when we got clouds, we got seasons, and now we had a very different climate. What else did we have? You forgot. Okay. If you remember, you raise your hand. What else? A rainbow. A rainbow. Very good. Okay. We got rainbows. What else happened? What's that? Say again, sweetie, I can't hear you. More human? Well, I'll give you one for that. <laughs> so one of the things that began to happen when there was a flood, and you have to consider this, the Bible says it rained for 40 days and 40 nights. That's a lot of water. How's the longest you've ever seen it rain? Maybe an hour? Kind of a week when it just drizzles? The Bible's account doesn't say it drizzled for 40 days and 40 nights. It said the floodgates of the heavens opened and the fountains of the deep. Now, when you think of a floodgate, what do you think of? Just a little bit of water or lots and lots of water? Lots and lots of water was coming down. Now, if there were clouds in the sky, you would have had a, uh, a cloud canopy that probably would have been so, so thick, it would have been dark and gloomy all the time. But that doesn't appear to be what the, the Earth version 1 and 2 enjoyed. It appears that it was a, this great greenhouse and that plants flourished, animals flourished. Another thing that happens if you look at the account when they come off the ark, God says, guess what about the animals? Something changed between man and the animals. He said, they're going to fear you now. And if they fear you now, that means before they weren't afraid of you. You could go up and you could pet whatever animal, and you never had to be afraid of them, and they were never afraid of you. He also changed the diet. He said, no longer will you eat plants. Guess what you get to eat? Meat. You get to eat steak. <laughs> okay, maybe the only good thing that came, there was a the result of the ark. So the world changed dramatically, and when you, let's see if, what slide we're on. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Now let's look what happens on the, t the biblical account of the timelines. We see these guys who lived hundreds of years, and now as soon as Noah gets off the boat, Noah lived to 950 years old. All of a sudden, the ages start dropping like a rock. Something happened. And they believe that what happened was this canopy broke that protected the world, that gave it this perfect atmosphere, that produced a perfect environment to produce really healthful, nutritious food, was now lost. And what does the Bible show? Exactly that. Something began to happen. It wasn't that they made a mistake about how old people were. It realized it. It was just recounting exactly what happened. And men's lives began to shorten dramatically. So then the next question I ask, okay, well, if there was a flood, is there any proof for a flood? Well, if you go out there and you look at the fossil record, what do you see? You see billions of dead things buried in rock, laid down by water all over the earth. Exactly what should happen in the biblical account. Now what scientists, when they read those layers, they'll tell you is that, well, this generation of animals lived and then they died off and the next generation came along and they died off. Well, that's not really the biblical account. If you look, listen to a creation scholar, they'll tell you if the fountains of the deep began to burst open. So you're talking great fissures are being opened up at the, on uh, the, well, not the bottom of the ocean because that wasn't there yet, on the crust of the land and the continents began to separate. So this water is shooting up in dramatic fashion. 
all of a sudden the heaven, the floodgates of the heavens are open up and tremendous amount of water is flowing down. What's going to happen? Flood. You're going to get flood, but when you get a flood, what do you get? Death. Well, yeah, death. <laughs> you get erosion. What happens to the dirt when all of a sudden it's hit by lots of water? Starts going into the ocean, right? And guess what? All of this dirt and debris is coming up from the ground and coming off of the land. Guess who the first guys to die are going to be? The guys on the bottom. And that's exactly what the fossil record shows. What's the next one? As more and more debris enter into the water, right? The fish who are living in the water can't sustain all of that dirt and debris that's coming in, and they're the next guys down. Then you get everybody who's living along the coast, the amphibians, maybe some of the dinosaurs, and now they begin to get covered, and they become the next layer. So the strata can be explained in terms of the biblical account of the flood. And that's how you begin to look at some of this stuff, and you're going, this is very interesting, because I'm starting to understand why I can put my trust in the biblical account. Now, I had to ask myself, is there any proof that man and dinosaurs ever existed at the same time? Turns out, if you go to, to a place called Rose, Texas, they have, dinosaur, they have fossil footprints in the ground, and they are dinosaurs, and through those dinosaur footprints are human footprints. Now, I met a geologist one time, and I was asking him about this. And he was fascinated with this. So he went back to his geology teachers at the University of Colorado, and asked the geology teachers if that was true. And he said, no, that's not true. And he said, well, why is that not true? He said, well, everybody knows that animals and dinosaurs didn't live at the same time. So he said, well, is there any problem with the fossil record at Rose, Texas? And the dean of uh, geology said, oh, no, at Rose, Texas, those are perhaps some of the best fossils in the entire United States. So why don't you believe that man and dinosaurs existed at the same time? The professor's response was, well, everybody knows they didn't live at the same time. You're going, well, wait a minute. You have to be true to both sides of the story. You have to look at all sides. How did, how did Noah get all those dinosaurs on the ark? Eggs. Eggs. Right. So a dinosaur egg turns out to be really pretty small. You know an interesting thing about dinosaurs? Dinosaurs never stop growing. So if you had a world where there was no death, in a perfect environment with lots of vegetation, and men were living a thousand years, do you think maybe dinosaurs or lizards lived to be a thousand years? And if a lizard was a thousand years old, how big would he get? Really, really big. All of us, see, we have limits to our growth, and most of the mammals have that. But lizards don't. They can grow as big as the environment will support as long as they don't die. Let's go to the next slide. Anybody know what this is? Pterodactyl. Very good. I bet you knew what that was, didn't you? Okay. So if you search the, do the research on pterodactyls, you know what they found out about pterodactyls? Pterodactyls can't fly. That's what they'll tell you. Does that look like he can't fly? They're not, they're not actually dinosaurs. They're not actually dinosaurs. They're not. Okay. Okay, we'll talk about that later. <laughs> so it turns out when they do all the aerodynamics on these animals, they're so huge that they can't fly. Right? From the aerodynamics that we understand. But what the scientists weren't looking at is, but what conditions would have made it possible for those animals to fly? turns out if it, there was a vapor canopy over the earth and the earth had a higher degree of oxygen, the PSI of the, of the surrounding oxygen would have been great enough for these animals to fly. That's why some of the creation scientists go, that sure looks like a flying creature to me. And if you put him in the right environment that the Bible seems to indicate existed, guess what? All of a sudden he can fly. Anybody know who this next guy is? Yeah, Brachiosaurus. Anybody know where these guys lived? Land. Land, good. What part? They, there were some of them who lived in the United States. Guess what state they lived in? Colorado. Colorado. Who said that? 
Good job. Colorado. Anybody ever been in Colorado? No. Yeah. Does Colorado look like that? No. No, not anymore it doesn't. But evidently, if you want to support brachiosaurus, those guys eat a lot of vegetation. You're going to have to have massive, massive amounts of vegetation. We don't find that in the mountains, right? They'd be eating toothpicks and getting splinters in their mouth. Evidently, the vegetation was very different. And that's what we, can, we continue to see as we look at different things. How about this next animal? Anybody know what this is? If you can read, you can tell it. It's a fish. You're going to have so much candy. It's a coelacanth. You know a coelacanth went extinct 65 million years ago. They, yes, they did. They found one of these guys in 1938. It was, oops. What we thought was the truth evidently has exceptions. So whenever you're told something, do the research. Find out what the truth is. Find out if there's exceptions. Don't take anybody's word for it. Don't take my word. Do your own research. Find out what the truth is, because when you look at both sides, you'll find some amazing things. Let's look at the next one. This has kind of been in the, the news lately. Anybody know what that is? No, not a tooth. It's a dinosaur bone, but there's something special about that dinosaur bone. He's called a wet tissue dinosaur bone. You know what wet tissue dinosaur bone means? What's that? Yeah, it still has blood in it. It's like, wait a minute, that's a 200 million year old bone. There's no way that has blood and tissue in it. Guess what? It has blood and tissue in it. And now they're having to go, that doesn't fit the narrative either, does it? Do the research. Anybody know what this is? It's a coal sign. Yeah, and it's in Wyoming. Right? One state up from us. You know what you need to make coal? Fossil fuel. Fossil fuel. No, it is a fossil fuel. But what you need is massive amounts of vegetation. Something had to have happened to kill all of these plants and bring them into a single location and cover them with lots of pressure and time, and they turn into coal. Anybody ever been into Wyoming? There's not a lot of plant vegetation there. Something very different was going on. So hopefully I want you to take two things out of our lesson today. One is take both sides of every issue and learn what the truth is. Don't accept anybody's answer for what they tell you about how things happen, right? Read your Bibles, learn what God has to say. The other thing I want you guys to understand is an important story. And probably the thing that convinced me most about the biblical account is something I'm going to share with you today. Did you know that God loves you a lot? How much does God love you? Lots and lots and lots. One of the things that's interesting when we go back to the biblical account of what was going on, remember I showed you all those guys who lived really, really a long time? Well, this is Adam all the way to Noah. Did you know their names have meanings? Anybody know what the, your name means? Did you know your name means something? Yes. No, 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 no. My name is Dan. That means God is my judge. And hidden in this Genesis account is something very special. All of these old guys tell you a story that God loves you. Can I show you? So you start off with the first guy. And what was the first guy's name? Adam. Do you know what Adam means? What does it mean? Well, it means man right? And each of these guys in the 10 generations from Adam to Noah have a name and their name means something. So let me tell you what their names mean. Seth means appointed. Enos means mortal. Canaan means sorrow. Mahalalel means blessed God. Jared, the next in line, his name means shall come down. Enoch means teaching. Methuselah means his death will bring, and Lamech means despairing. And finally, the last guy is Noah, and Noah's name means rest. When you put that all together, do you know what it tells you? Hidden in the Genesis account is the story of how much God loves you. 
it says, Man was appointed mortal sorrow, but the blessed God shall come down, teaching his death will bring the despairing rest. Now, how cool is that? Right? Pretty cool. Hidden in the book of generations, or in the book of Genesis, to give you an idea how everything came to be, is the gospel message. To give you an understanding, when you do the research, when you look closely, you will find incredible things. Jesus is on every page almost. God is trying to tell you over and over again how important you are and how much he loves you. So did you all have fun today? Yep. Yep. I hope you learned some things right? And beware of that dinosaur when you're leaving today, okay?